Welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Bogdan Imre uh, and I will talk to you today about Lore of Course, um, what I call an adventurous way of learning about oneself uh, and much more. Um, a few points that I want to cover today. So I'll, I'll share a few words about myself as a practitioner uh, in the field. Um, then I would like to zoom a little bit out to look at the wider framework uh, uh, where we can position uh, lower rope course. Then we're going to zoom in, look, looking a bit at the history, some of the concepts related to this, and also the outcomes that are usually pursued uh, in lower rope course. Practice and theory will follow. So here I want to share um, the bigger piece uh, of this presentation will be about a particular practice that, um, that I, I, I use. And I will pinpoint some theoretical elements to it. And last but not least, I will close uh, with some uh, critical questions that come from the perspective of a practitioner, but also keeping uh, participants in mind. Um, now, about myself, uh, a few words about myself. So my name is Bogdan Imre, and I've been involved in uh, this particular field for quite some time. First of all, I see myself as a so-called long-term amateur. So I've been uh, mountain hiking since the 90s, uh, rock climbing since 2000, beginning of 2000, same for, for biking, especially long distance ones. And more recently, uh, over, I, I've been taking over kayaking. So these are some of the practices that I, I use in, um, uh, in the outdoor, uh, mainly recreational, because uh, obviously when we talk about low rope course, that's part of the practice that I, that I have. So I also see myself as a long-term professional. And from this perspective here, I'll add that I started as a practitioner in the non-formal education sector back in 2001. And I've been involved in several international organizations, both non-governmental and governmental, so like Youth Action for Peace, uh, the Asia Bureau, Asia Europe Foundation in Singapore, uh, CCIVS uh, based in Paris at UNESCO, and also I'm I'm a member of the pool of trainers of the Council of Europe, um, and it's specifically about uh, outdoor education. I pursued my master's in outdoor and experiential learning in 2014. Uh, in the UK with the University of, of Cumbria. And I also uh, participate in, in the training of trainers from um, run by Outdoor Bound Romania. Probably uh, most of you know Outdoor Bound being um, the first uh, outdoor education uh, organization uh, in the world uh, dating back to the 1940s. Okay, so this is in big lines about me. If, by the way, if along the way you have questions about any of these elements, that I present, please feel free to use the microphone, stop me, uh, and, and we can have, a, we can have an, an interaction of that. Now, moving from who am I and what I do, um, let's look a little bit at a low rope course, but let's first position it within the wider framework. So just to make sure that we have the basics uh, for this, it's important to mention that um, we are talking about outdoor education as the wider field. And here I selected one of the um, definitions that I particularly uh, uh, like, which talks about outdoor education being a learning climate, actually, that offers opportunities for direct laboratory experience in identifying and resolving uh, real life problems. And why do we do this for acquiring skills? Um, with which we enjoy a lifetime of creating living for attaining concepts and insights uh, about human and uh, natural resources and for getting us back in touch with the aspects of living uh, where our roots were uh, once firmly established. And I really like this, particularly this last part. I still remember during my, my master's degree uh, when we were out in the forest with one of my teachers, he, he grabbed a stick from the floor, a fairly a long piece of uh, wood, and he said, if this would be human history, he took his pinky, he put it at the end uh, of the stick and says, this is the amount of time we've been indoors. So it shows again, uh, you know, uh, this uh, idea of outdoor education being also somehow a way for us to go back to, to these roots of being out there in nature and living with uh, nature. And speaking of nature, as you see, um, the photo I'm sharing with you actually is, is not uh, something, all the photos, by the way, are photos taken by me or my colleagues during the trainings. 
This one I took uh, just before we started one of the days on low rope course. I see Vera nodding because she remembers uh, she was there. Uh, there was this absolutely fantastic uh, little bug that just showed up on the asphalt on our way uh, to the forest. And, and, and again, it's just to, to, to see to what extent the, this beauty of nature comes and, and encounters us uh, on various occasions. If this is clear, I'll move on to say, okay, within this wider picture and wider framework of outdoor education, we have also the adventure uh, education and the adventure dimension. And here... I was looking for the de at the definition of Prouty, uh, who talks about it being defined as uh, direct, active, and engaging learning experiences that involve the whole person, uh, so physical, emotional, rational, spiritual, and have real consequences. And this is the part that refers to uh, challenges, to risks, uh, and, and so on and so forth. So these are the two uh, let's say, wider uh, definitions of the wider fields within which we, we would situate um, um, low rope courses. Now, is it, is it okay so far? Yeah? Yeah, going good. Good. Then let's move forward and let's look a little bit by zooming in at some of the concepts, the timeline and, uh, and outcomes. In, and I'll start with the concepts because I think it's it's um, probably uh, the first thing to look at to look try to define a bit. When you talk about low rope course, um, one of the way to look at it is that it is actually a method that is used in outdoor adventure. So it's a sort of a means of to comes that we're looking at when we uh, use uh, adventure education in a in a specific uh, setting. And uh, if we look more precisely or technically uh, to say so, it's considered a, an apparatus intentionally designed. So there's the, the intention dimension is there. And it's used in adventure learning that requires participants to be off the ground anywhere between two centimeters and four meters. Now, some, one might say four meters is a lot. Well, it is a lot, but, but the idea is that there is always the support there. And we're going to look at the safety and security a little bit later when we talk about it. So if we look just to the right, uh, we you see this photo. This is an outdoor activity. There is a rope involved, and we're going to come to the rope section in, in a minute as well. However, it's not a low rope course, because as you see, we should be above the ground, two centimeters to four meters. So the activity in itself should take place uh, without touching the ground and without requiring uh, the use of a belay system. This is important because the moment the belay system comes in, we're talking about high rope course, which is, a, again, a different uh, method, a different uh, tool that, that we use. Now, uh, this concept of low ropes has also other names, and it's important to mention them because... Uh, just for, for the purpose of also of transparency, but also the clarity. So we have initiative, rope course, or team challenge course. And the main, one of the main uh, element that we are the main elements that we are looking at working with, it, there are the social dimension, the physical dimension, the mental and the emotional. So these are usually involved when we talk about uh, low rope course. And, and there is a distinction that it's important to be made that is between the so-called obstacle course and the so-called challenge course or rope course, as you've seen. So the distinction is, is, is simple in the obstacle course. Um, maybe the easiest image to, to, that comes to my mind is the, the, this famous show, which is called The American Ninja, right? This is, an this is the, the best example uh, in terms of clarity of, of an obstacle course because it's about you as an individual going through that particular challenging course by yourself. But in a challenge course, it is important that there is a social dimension that is involved. It's not always present, but that is one of those defining moments uh, and defining elements, that there are people either supporting you, so less direct or working with you, which is, means a direct involvement of, of the social dimension. So this would be some of the elements. Now let's look at the timeline, just to have an idea also where uh, low ropes, where do, when did they start? How did they start? What were some of the, the key elements there? And here I would say 
30s and 40s are the first years. Obviously, this coincides again uh, with, the with the work of Kurt Hahn and the creation of Outdoor Bound. Uh, and at the time, uh, basically, there was a very military-like use of the equipment. So the, also the way, uh, the way some of the programs were carried out had a very military, uh, military style at the time. Um, and of course, because of Outdoor Bound, um, the way they were also designed and the way they were used were also in relation to teaching these survival skills for seamen. So there was that dimension that, that, that was also involved there. And at the time, the, the most famous tools or the, the, the one that came uh, and were used most in the beginning were the wall and the beam. The wall, basically, it is this construction. It's a little uh, wooden, usually, plank or wall that is, uh, that is created and has a height. It depends. It could be between two meters and a half to up to three meters and a half. Could be even more. Depends how it is designed. And basically, um, the team has to actually cross without using any external um, uh, tools or, or elements except their own bodies and the wall itself. And the beam is basically a horizontal uh, piece of wood on which the team has to balance. And there are different ways of actually using it and, and, and uh, uh, for pedagogical reasons. So these were these very first uh, acts. Now, if we continue the timeline, what is interesting to see is that in the 60s and the 70s, uh, as um, Outdoor Bound also arrived uh, in the US, if I'm not uh, wrong, it is 1962. Uh, basically, there was an increased use, particularly in the US, uh, of low rope courses. And 70s and 80s uh, was also the, the time when Project Adventure was born, which was, a, a let's say, a, I would call it a sister organization somehow of Outdoor Bound. And they were developing uh, a lot of outdoor education uh, projects. Um, what they were doing, among others, uh, they were working also in informal uh, education setting, so bringing somehow the wilderness uh, to, to the young people. And the 80s saw a bit of an institutionalization of, of low ropes, basically, because what happened was that more and more uh, programs were developed for more and more purposes, including therapeutical, organizational management-wise, so they were used in, in, various, in various fields, actually. Um, what happens is then in the 90s, the 90s also saw a shift uh, in terminology uh, from rope to challenge course. So we still use low rope course for some uh, some reason. Probably it, it's we are we are I don't know maybe more familiar with this term, but it's interesting to see that there were also these shifts. And if you remember, uh, just earlier there were also other terms actually that are used for this particular practice. Now. This being said, I think we can stop here with this particular uh, uh, theoretical elements and go more towards the practice. Do you have any questions so far? Anything that, uh, that you'd like me to clarify a bit more, maybe? No. Okay, good. I, I have one, uh, is there any uh, differences or are you aware of any differences of approaching the low rope challenge course uh, in Europe? depending on the geography of our continent? Uh, that's a good question. Actually, what I can say, because um, my, my intention was to also join uh, 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 and to work with the standards on the European level. And there is a European association that deals with, with, um, with rope courses. Um, so there is a sort of a standardized training for practitioners. But I'm going to get to this part a little bit later because I think this is always a question. Uh, to what extent? I mean, for me, it's a question that is important. Certification versus practice. Because we can't all get certified uh, in, in, in the fields. And also, once you are certified, as far as I understood, there are some criteria and some elements that you need to, to work with afterwards. And not everyone, especially people that are working as independent consultants, not everyone can fulfill the, those criteria. So it might be a little bit, a little bit tricky. So in, in principle, there, there is a European standardized approach. But then uh, I don't think that there's a wide network. Uh, and I say that because, for example, in my pursuit uh, of this goal of getting certified, I realized that um, countries where, where outdoor um, activities are extremely well developed are not even represented in this. Uh, so, for example, in France, it's not on the map. 
there is Germany with a lot of centers. There is uh, Luxembourg. Uh, there is um, Switzerland. Um, and but we don't have France, for example. I didn't see Italy. Um, I, I I've seen something with Austria, but not sure. So there are lots of lots of countries that are not there, unfortunately. Yeah. Okay, good. If that's clear, then let's talk about practice and um, and the joy of practice. And I would obviously look at the key elements before we actually see the practice in itself. And, and these are, at least from a practitioner perspective, very, very important. We need to look at the space and what do we want to do in the space? What kind of rope course, low rope course, do we want to work with? So here in, the, in this particular picture, you have me and, and one of my colleagues um, with whom I work on a regular basis together uh, with Vera. Um, you have our tools, so the ropes, and obviously we are also using elements that our practitioner might not use in low rope course, which is slack lines, for example, um, and our choice. So it's very, it's not that easy. It may sound easy, you know, you just pick a spot and you go and do low rope course, but it doesn't really work like that. So for example, to find this spot, it took us almost half a day of really finding a place where the level, the ground is level, where there are not uh, ox or, or other kind of obstacles or other kind of elements that could be extremely dangerous for the people. Um, then the other element that is important is also the distance between the trees. So we, we're going to look at these, like how are our uh, tree friends? Are they healthy? Uh, are they strong enough? Are they big enough? Et cetera, et cetera. So we need to look at all these elements before setting up. Then there is the weather. Uh, and this is something that, okay, let's say in the summer uh, and unfortunately in the, in the last couple of years, it's a bit more predictable in the sense that if you look at the weather forecast a couple of days in advance, Knowing the climate change is there, there is a high chance it's going to be hot. It's going to be, you know, not, you know, if the weather for three, four days is no rain, there's a high chance there won't be any rain. But if it's rain, uh, if there is rain, if there is a storm, uh, you know, what do you, what decisions do you, do you uh, make a, as a, uh, as an outdoor practitioner? Very important. Then we need to also look at the team and, and what is the expertise that we have in the team? Are we uh, a team of people that have practiced it, that, that we have done this? Are we a team that, that also is able to look for elements of safety and security, for example, first aid or, or other like uh, uh, issues? Um, I mean, it, it is important to have those elements in, in mind. And then, of course, last but not least, it's also important to look at the, ben at the, at the beneficiaries. Who are those beneficiaries? Who are the participants? I speak of my practice. Of my practice, I work with, with usually with young people, but in general, it's with adults actually, because um, the last groups that we've worked with, they the average age was around probably thirty, but I would say the youngest uh, was eighteen or nineteen, and the oldest uh, around fifty plus to sixty. So there's a, a wider uh, age gap there, which is important because not everyone has the same physical stamina. And not everyone will have the same reaction when they see the ropes uh, and they need to go get on them. So there are the, these considerations that we need to make sure we keep them in mind. And there's one more thing I want to share. That's the time frame. So also how, how, how long do you want to work with, um, uh, with the low rope courses and so on and so forth. Yeah. Then, oh, sorry, going backwards. And then there is the very important aspect of the safety check. And here, uh, at least uh, when you get certified, the advantage of, of having a certification is, is that these, this, there is a bit uh, deeper work on, um, on the standards, uh, operating procedures and the standards that are around it. So it is important, even if you don't work with them, uh, uh, and if, even if you don't have the certification, that you for sure have this basic understanding of the safety concerns that are there. And if there are also local operating procedures, not just standard operating procedures, that you also familiarize yourself with that. Um, and that, that can be about the, the ropes themselves and about the way you set them up, or, or it can also be about the environment itself. For example, you may end up being in a private forest. What does it mean? 
or if you're in a public forest, what kind of obligations do you have? So it's also about the way you interact with nature. It's not just about uh, you and your cables or your ropes and how you take care or not take care of the trees. It's, it's more complex than that. So these elements are there. Then, of course, it's all about um, the way you set up, actually, the, the apparatus and the way you instruct and you work with the participants. It's also important, once you are set up, to look for uh, checking the elements, make sure there is a proper, proper setup, the inspection of the ground, as I mentioned earlier, for, for sharp uh, objects, whatever they are, for objects that could be uh, a real danger to, to people, so avoiding those areas or finding ways to, to cover them in order to make sure that there's no injury. Um, and of course, as I, I talked earlier about the trees, uh, how, how healthy are the trees? Are there branches somewhere above that maybe are are dry and and if there is a wind this could fall because this could be actually uh causing harm uh, to you and and to to the participants so important to to keep that in mind then one other aspect that is important to think about is the accident types and and rates so have a, at least a, a look at at uh, the literature and see a bit what research says about accidents uh, types and rates there are all kind of accidents i'm not going to go in the details of it uh, it's not the most joyous part of of of, of, a, of the work of a of an outdoor instructor uh, or adventure uh, instructor but they 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 are there and just to give you um um a rough uh, interpretation there is the the trust fall and the wall these are in project adventures uh, research. They did a research for about um, monitoring about 20 years of practice. These are the two uh, highest ranking exercises prone to accident and actually producing accidents. So it's already important to, uh, you know, like such information already tells you, at least puts you in a position of uh, precautiousness. You know, you need to be precautious, you need to take care, you need to make sure that you are uh, you know, do, doing your job because this is part of our job. Uh, whether participants monkey around and play around and so on, that's that's another story. But at least as a practitioner, you need to make sure that you uh, you get that uh, that part right. And then, when it comes to also practice, we're also talking about setting it up. So, what? How are we setting? Do we just want to work with a sim single separate element, or do we want to create a circuit? Um, and for what purpose we use what? So in, in the trainings that we we were carrying out with Vera and Eduard, one of the things that, that we've done is we use separate elements for different purposes. Uh, and then we use the circuit itself. Uh, and I'm going to come in, in a few minutes to, uh, to this. Actually, it's the next part, which is a full day of roping uh, around and, and learning, basically. So... This full day, this this practice that that uh, we put uh, in, uh, out there consists of several uh, several elements. So we are looking at, uh, and if you allow me the word uh, play, knots knowing. So first of all, it's about getting to know the knots. So we're, I'm not just bringing participants to a bunch of trees with everything set up and say, okay, now have fun, enjoy. No, we bring them to the forest. There is nothing. We learn knots. The way we usually do it is by using the so-called teamwork lecture method in which participants work in small groups and each, groups, each group learns one particular knot. Uh, and once they master that knot, we create new groups. And in these new groups, we would have one representative from each of the previous groups. So each participant brings his or her knot that he or she learned before, and then they share. And the point is that at the end, everyone knows all the knots. And this is the knots teaching part, right? Once we have that, then we have the setup part. Uh, and in the setup, uh, you will see in a few moments, we, and you've seen the photos just earlier. So we present them with this kind of uh, uh, little drawings, uh, indicate the trees in between which these apparatus can be installed. And then their job would be to, to do that. And we work here, obviously, with feedbacking, with supporting, looking what knots uh, are best for which uh, uh, you know, for which connections and so on and so forth. So participants also understand a bit the background of the knots and what they are used uh, for uh, better. Then we do the experiencing part. So this is the moment where they, you know, they just go uh, from one end to the other uh, uh, of the of the course. Uh, they enjoy. 
And we have also moments, uh, uh, we create also this moment to go beyond boundaries. And, and you will see what we mean with that. And of course, afterwards, obviously following uh, the Kolb cycle of experiential learning, uh, we are also sitting down and reviewing the day and the entire experience and drawing a bit the learning that comes from, from that. Um, so the not snow part, as I mentioned, is the part where we select a couple of knots. Uh, just to give you a few examples, we would look at, for example, the butterfly knot. We would look at the double fishermen, uh, which are knots that are, are, are you know, extremely useful for this. Um, the cloth hitch, obviously. Uh, and so on and so forth. And it's really simple. There is this first moment when each uh, person, I mean, in a, in a team, they all learn the same knot and then the second one in which they share. What we've done also is that we came across an application uh, uh, that can be used for the knot so people can see step by step how the knot is made. And each application, I mean, for each knot, there are also points about the not uh, strong points, uh, negative points, so what to be aware of and so on. So we also encourage people to change that once they get to uh, the teaching not part. And then, then we have the setup part. And this is the setup part. And you see uh, in the picture here, where you have the, this um, little drawing and then just in front of you, we've set it up. And when we, set up, when we are done with this, usually it's about time, time for lunch. It's time for a break. So we, we, we go for the break, take a, take a bit of a rest because it's quite, uh, uh, it's quite energy draining, setting up everything. But, and then once we have done that, then we can, we can continue. Now, what I want to point out before we jump uh, to, um, to the actual uh, implementation and, and going through the, 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 the course is to talk very briefly about the challenge by choice. So bringing some of the theoretical elements already in. Challenge by choice it's, is obviously an approach that, that we take when we are working with the group uh, and participants basically have this opportunity of choosing the level of experience uh, they want in order to reach their optimal learning. Uh, what we do as practitioners and our role here is basically to coach them uh, in navigating uh, towards this level of their involvement and contribution so that they can see, do they need more of challenge? Do they need less? Are they, uh, you know, are they um, maybe scared? There's a lot of, uh, a lot of participants uh, uh, have this, this, this issue of fear, even though it's not high and so on. Still, they are facing it uh, and we need to be aware of that. Um, and what is important to highlight here is that um, challenge by choice that don't necessarily imply opting out. Um, why, why am I saying this? Because this would be an, an easy way out. It, it, it's also a way to, to sort of escape a, a, a challenge. But going back to, to the previous points before, what is important for you, uh, uh, for me at least as a practitioner, is to be aware that, yes, there may be that fear. Uh, uh, that participants have, uh, they see the challenge being maybe too big. So then propose, working with them is extremely important here in proposing them tasks that would fit uh, or their learning needs. So we don't tend to take them out uh, in, you know, in the panic zone. And I'm going to come back and also talk briefly about that later, but allow them still to be in the process of learning. So if somebody uh, feels comfortable, uh, doesn't feel comfortable going up and really uh, doing the entire course, maybe they can take roles that are still challenging for them uh, and get something out, out of that. So what is important to keep in mind for the challenge by choice and the way we present it is that there should be a very clear goal uh, that is there. What is the goal? In the case of participants, we can look at what is what do they want to actually learn from this process? And then we need to make it uh, clear that they have the option of opting out with, of course, uh, the idea that they need to, to be still uh, engaged in the process. So not simply as spectators stepping out, but still being part of it and looking at, at the task that would, uh, that would still fit their learning goal. And then last but not least, it's about also the respect uh, from the rest of the group towards the decisions uh, from those participants that uh, may, for example, want to uh, uh, go for the challenge by choice. So it's extremely important to keep uh, these, these aspects in mind. 
Clear so far? All good? Okay, good. Now let's look at, at the next uh, the next element. So what we have is obviously once once we are starting, we get people uh, up. Obviously, you will have different roles during this experience. Uh, very often, we manage to have two participants going through uh, the course at the same time. One starting, and then a couple of we we are leaving two elements at least between them. Then we can have another one starting. So you you would have always uh, roughly five people at the same time working on on the low rope course. So you would have four people spotting, one person running, and eventually one of us might be as, as instructors and uh, facilitators might be there also to support, keeping an eye on, on how, how, uh, how things are going. Now, what is important to, to keep in mind uh, also in, from the perspective of, um, of theory when we work with, with such elements as, as low rope courses is this four dimensions that are there in outdoor adventure. And, and we play an important role to set up also the scene for participants to understand what this exercise is about. Why do I say this? Because these four levels are extremely important. The first of them is when we look at outdoor as an outdoor recreation slash entertainment uh, use. And, and there is nothing wrong in that. I mean, there is nothing wrong. I mean, we ourselves are probably doing just going for a hike on our holidays or taking the kayak, going out and, and so on. Uh, but it's important to know that when we work as uh, practitioners in the field, we always look for the educational dimension. So for the educational use of outdoor and, uh, and or adventure. Or we may also look at the developmental adventure uh, use meaning working for example with a group on a maybe a longer term and at least in my in my practice i work with groups maybe on a longer term and then i'm really following what are the points that they are uh, actually getting educationally from the process and how they are implementing and how their practice uh, is developing throughout time so it's important and the last level which is uh, something that i cannot work with but I find uh, extremely important is the therapeutic adventure use. And here we are talking about uh, specific uh, groups as well. Remember one of the questions before we start was also who are our beneficiaries? Who do we work with? Um, a, for example, if you work with young people that have, um, that are, have issues with uh, use of drugs or um, families where there is abuse and so on and so forth, you can actually use the outdoor and you can use adventure uh, settings in order to work on those particular issues and to support somehow people to get out of the troubles that they are in, let's say. Uh, however, as a practitioner, you need to have a specific, also a specific training, uh, notably um, a specific also psychological uh, training in order to, to work with this. This is something that I, I cannot work with uh, uh, and I find it really difficult and tough. Uh, and for I have a lot of esteem for my colleagues that are doing this. There we go. So this would be the four, the four uses that we need to keep in mind. And I say, wh why do I say that this is important again? Because if we can also set the framework for the people when we go on the ropes, it's not, it is fun. Obviously, there will be fun involved, but there's also a lot of learning. And if we manage to bring this to their attention, the chance of learning outcomes being more clear at the end of the process is also higher. If we just go and have fun, which again, as I said, there is nothing wrong with that, it's also fine. But then we just set the whole thing up only for having fun. And usually the trainings we do or the, the educational activities we carry out, they are not just for fun. Fun will be there, that's for sure. So set that mood also for the people, that focus on what you are doing now, stay focused, be in the now, be present, uh, because there will be things uh, that you will observe about yourself. If you are only letting yourself go with, with the wave of having fun, then you might miss some of these elements, which, which could be quite quite useful. See here some of the, our participants uh, in the practice itself. Uh, there's the, this intersection between two on the left side, uh, uh, two elements, so crossing uh, from one element to the other, and the other one is uh, just starting from, from one of them. Uh, and the elements that 
if we look also at, uh, sorry, uh, there we are. If we also look at uh, one of the things that talks to us a lot uh, as practitioners is looking at body language. So looking at participants and seeing how they are reacting and how their body is behaving, looking at, at, at uh, maybe at, at the way is the, are the hands or the feet shaking, uh, looking at and listening to the breath, seeing what is the rhythm of the breath, hearing what people are saying actually while they are on the, on the, on the, on the ropes. This gives give us a lot of clues actually about the entire experience, about what is actually happening uh, to people uh, going through through that, and one of the theory that that is used in order to work on on on, on uh, with participants on this is basically the optimal arousal theory, uh, and you see here a, a very short graph that is adapted from uh, uh, M J Ellis, um, and it's presented by uh, Bisson, uh, and we are basically looking at. The, the the two aspects the fact that when we are in in a, in an adventure setting we could be under aroused or over aroused uh, and when we are under aroused uh, what would happen is that the tendency is that the level of performance and motivation would drop and this is also um, the pitfall of being over aroused that also the level of our performance is also dropping and also the motivation might be might be leaving us so what happens is that we should, as practitioner, look at the possibility of proposing uh, people to uh, arrive at this uh, sort of emotional state, I would say, called optimal arous arousal. It's a level of stimulation and challenge uh, that leads to the highest level of performance. And what is really interesting about this is that um, there is, this is the theory, right, about, about it, but there is no other supporting theory meaning not we are all different we all have different optimal arousal points for various reasons including our own uh, experience including our own capacity including all our own uh, ability to perceive and to work with with risk and so on and so forth so this is where um, what comes in handy was what I mentioned earlier, being able to observe participants, understanding how they are behaving, how their body is reacting when they are in, um, in the course, seeing what could be too much, uh, seeing how we could intervene, how we could support them, and so on and so forth. And for some people, uh, and, and there are quite a few, uh, this kind of rope, low rope course might be actually a walk in the park, meaning it would be very, very basic. So they would be under aroused. So you would have to also make sure that you add elements maybe that could, uh, you know, bring them as well to function at that optimal arousal to get the best out of, of that particular uh, adventure, uh, adventure uh, experience. And this this part is also talking, it, it, it goes along the same way. So we're here we're just sort of inverting and we're using the risk level instead of performance. So uh, we have the level of risk versus the level of, uh, of arousal. Um, there was Evert in 1989 who, who talked about it and basically saying that the practitioner, what we can do as practitioners is we can control that level of, of arousal by, as I mentioned, um, looking at this risk, the level of risk, and playing a little bit with that in order to make sure that people uh, get to that uh, point of, of optimal arousal. And how we can do that, so how we can make sure that people get to this optimal arousal is by either increasing the number of choices that are there. So all of a sudden, uh, instead of just having a simple choice that, okay, we just go for the walk in the park, we have more choices. And, and you know, that already creates, a, brings a little bit of, uh, uh, of uh, uh, stress in, in the process of thinking and, and seeing what you want to do. We can also increase the complexity and you will see some examples as well. I'll, I'll come back to that. I'll make a reference back to this theory a bit later. So we can in increase the, the complexity or simply create a stimulus overload. So putting really a lot of elements that are there so that all of a sudden, uh, you know, people who, as I said, were more on a walk in the park, uh, they are more uh, aroused and more uh, closer to this, uh, they get closer to this point uh, uh, that is needed for them. So, and this is somehow the way that we go beyond 
uh, regular boundaries. And as you see in this in this particular image, uh, somebody is just going for the low rope course, but using blindfolds. And and I can say from my personal experience, but also from the experience of participants, it, it changes everything. It's a completely. It's almost a, a different uh, uh, exercise, actually. Even though uh, you know the setting is the same, but the way you experience it by taking one of the senses away brings it brings you to another level. So this is one way to work with this uh, optimal arousal uh, uh, element, for example. Another thing that is connected to um, to this um, is uh, and going beyond boundaries, and I spoke a little bit about it, is this comfort and learning and the panic zones uh, element. And what is important for me, and I, I do want to stress this because I think this is uh, really important, at least coming again from one of my discoveries in my, during my master's, is that there is no theory. It's not a theory. There is no theory about comfort, learning, and panic zones. Um, Mike Brown, if I'm not uh, mistaken, did the research looking at, uh, at, the, um, at the literature, and he found absolutely no... Uh, theoretical basis uh, that says that he suggests using it as a metaphor so using the comfort and the learning and the panic zones as a metaphor he finds it more appropriate and and i agree with that because when we when we present it as a theory it's almost um as you present it as something that it is tested and that that that's it but it does not as i said in the literature we won't we won't find uh, any research that that uh, fundamentates this, but looking at the metaphor is important because it will also create for participants these expectations that there will be a moment when a challenge is going to come, and there will be this moment where I will go out of my um, comfort zone or what I would call I will go out of my routine, and th this is the basic uh, thoughts uh, behind. Um, behind uh, this concept and behind this metaphor is that again, uh, one, we, we function uh, in our routine and usually we don't learn uh, anything when we are in the comfort zone. Uh, it's when we step out of that in the stretching zone. So in, in, in some, again, in some uh, 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 articles you see stretching in others you have learning and there are other uh, names as well. That's the moment when, when it actually happens. What, what is important for, for me to understand as a practitioner is that the outdoor instructor or facilitator uh, should be aware of the participants' needs. So we should be actually working with those needs. We should be able to understand who is in the comfort zone when we start such a process and who would be completely out of the comfort zone. And it's not, it's not something that it's obvious. Uh, sometimes you, you, you get to understand that by a, a chit chat in a break uh, sometimes it's it's extremely obvious because people come to you and say i'm not going to go do, i'm not going to do that uh, but we need to be aware also of all the signs that we don't see actually as i mentioned earlier we need to see how uh, what are what are the body you know the body signals what what signals does the body give us and what does it tell us because a practice um, does say that there are many people who are really, really, really scared and who could be in their panic zone on, on a simple element, something that to us is banal, is basic. They would be completely out their their comfort zone and way beyond the learning zone. And for me, it's important for us as practitioners to make sure that we don't cause any uh, psychological harm, not only physical uh, mental and so on, but also psychological. It's extremely, extremely important. So we need to keep also those dimensions in mind. Now, the other element that I wanted to share with you is also be going beyond borders is the mastery part. Uh, so this is where people are going beyond the regular. So people are using whatever you are creating to go beyond. This is just a, it's a photo for illustration. Uh, don't worry. Nobody was hurt in, in, uh, in this exercise. It's somebody who's mastering a, a specific skill and who can bring it to, uh, to, uh, to a, an apparatus that is not actually meant for that. But just to say, this is, a, again, as an exemplification, as an example, but just to say that we can also use uh, low ropes in order to master certain skills 
uh, um, in relation uh, to uh, being in an, an adventure education setting. And we can also use this for, uh, for the flow. Um, this is a theory, um, if you are aware of it, uh, created by uh, Mihai Chiksan Mihai in the 1999. Uh, and basically, with this flow theory, he talks about similarly like the optimal arousal. He talks about about risk uh, uh, taking and, and about us finding a balance. Um, and finding uh, um, a way of performing where we are in touch with ourselves, where we are present in what we are doing to the extent actually that time and space uh, literally disappears. I mean, I suppose many of you have found yourself maybe uh, at least once in your lifetime in, in, such, a, in such a situation. I can, I can say that for me, for example, um, the, 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 the most simple example I can give and the most evocative for me personally is, is rock climbing. Rock climbing is for me uh, the activity that brings me to, to flow. It's the moment where there is literally nothing else but me, my competencies and the risk that is there, perceived or uh, uh, actual. Uh, and being on the wall, being aware of every single movement I do, I don't I, I don't think about anything else but the climb. Uh, and, and that joy that is created by this, that, that uh, uh, I would say even freedom that comes with it is, is just priceless. So I don't know, uh, if you have experienced that, then you can have a, a quick read uh, around flow theory from, from Czech Cheeks and Mihai. It's, it's extremely, extremely uh, interesting. And this is something that we can also end up creating. It's it bringing people to the point where they actually experience that. They are on, on, on these apparatus uh, in the lower rope course, and they go through it completely focused on what is going on, being aware of the risk that is there, but also having the, the skills and using them in the best way uh, they can and really getting the best out of that experience, shutting out uh, the rest of the world and, and really being there uh, uh, and present. So these are some of uh, the elements that are related to uh, to um, to low rope courses and to this particular practice, usually the day, as I mentioned, ends up with with this reflection. And the, in this reflection, we obviously look at uh, purpose and, and outcomes uh, from it. And obviously, we are looking on on different dimension. For me personally, it's important to look on the participant side. Uh, and 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 we know that these activities they do have an individual and and, and team orientation, as I mentioned. So you can have. Uh, you can work with an individual, of course, having support there. So again, the social element is there. Uh, uh, I wouldn't recommend, uh, for me, this is this is not something that I, I would recommend going on, on a row, row corps by yourself, um, uh, especially if you have a group. So we are talking about training now. Uh, and the team oriented here, I'm talking about working with the others. But when it comes to outcomes, on the individual level, we can envisage a lot of elements that we are. We can talk about trust and confidence in yourself, but also in the others. Uh, we can talk about communication elements. So to, to what extent you are clear in the way you communicate, uh, even communication in relation to your needs. What do you need in, in that specific moment on that specific, specific part where you are uh, crossing a specific element of the low ropes and so on. And of course, it's about also about problem solving. So there's also learning uh, in relation to problem solving, finding ways out uh, 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 of situations that are uncomfortable or, or tricky. And, and you remember there was this photo in which we had these small swings. Uh, that is uh, one of these elements that is pretty tricky, actually, especially when you cross from one to the other. So people would spend more time there. And this is where you would also... Uh, realize that if you are not, uh, you know, physically fit, that uh, uh, quite a lot of energy would drain. So it's important not just to sit around and wait your turn, but it's also important for participants to observe what is happening and what others are doing. So they are anticipating, they are learning, and they're looking at how others are problem solving. So even adding that dimension to it, so that when you are on on the ropes, you go uh, and you you saw you you look at maybe putting in, in practice one of the solutions that you've seen there. When it comes to team orientation, there's also 
this dimension of leadership that is covered uh, and how you work with with others and how others relate to yourself um and, and so on and so forth so there are all these all these aspects are covered uh by uh, by the, the 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 possible outcomes of of, of using ro lower of course with participants it's important also to to look at um at at practitioners actually and and how there is a purpose or an outcome for us as practitioners and and for me challenge is uh, such an uh, an element that is also related to both to purpose and uh, outcomes to purpose because um we need to be extremely careful when when at least personally i tend to be extremely careful when i when i run uh, this particular uh, practice uh, for the very reason that there are a lot of things that can happen, uh, a lot of accidents. So being challenged by that uh, setting, by the fact that there's a group that is going to go out there is extremely rewarding in, in a way. Um, and same for, in terms of outcomes, uh, being a challenge, it's also important because you see yourself as a practitioner uh, ready to also learn. You will see what are some of the things that don't work, uh, and that that or the things that you might find difficult uh, to accomplish and learn from from that practice and of course uh, it's not nice uh, luckily so far uh, uh, touching wood it didn't happen but there's a lot of learning that can happen also from accidents things that you you know things that may happen and that you don't want to you want to make sure that they do not repeat uh, uh, ever again then there's the level of creativity also that that is involved because um, when we started building the very first LORUP courses, um, we had one or two, or we had three or four actually elements. Now we added more. So we were thinking, oh, how could we use the trees around? How could you use other elements? Could we just come to the forest and pick up a log and just uh, use that log somehow in, in this whole process? And this is how we came up with, with uh, uh, designing some, some elements. Uh, it that that we didn't think it's possible of course there's there's, there's the inspiration on the internet and you can also look uh, particularly particularly in this this publication uh, which is the cowtails and cobras too from Carl Ronke which is a, a classic actually in in a, uh, in in a, uh, outdoor and in an in adventure and you have a lot of examples of of, of these elements between the the trees and and so on uh, but you can also be creative you can also come up with, with other ways of, of, of doing things that maybe were not there. And it's extremely rewarding at the end. And it's also a way to test new things for, for you as a practitioner. And then, of course, I add this, just as I said, for participants, the trust and confidence, both in yourself, but also in the team members. Uh, I think this is a crucial element, uh, especially for, for practitioners. It's, it's, for me, it's a key, the trust in yourself, knowing where you come from, knowing what your practice is, and then the fact that you also work with others, at least in my case, uh, it's a blessing. Uh, and, and having developed a, a working and a personal, not just professional, but also personal relationship makes, makes a, a difference. Of course, problem solving as well, because there's always something that uh, goes uh, not according to plan. Mr. Murphy usually has a, his own way of intervening and, and uh, proposing a, to you uh, different different uh, challenges so that's also something that that you take uh, usually um, as an outcome from from low ropes now that being said maybe I, I just to check if you have any any questions so far i had this question in my mind uh, mm -hmm. uh, when you talk about this uh, spectrum of challenges uh, and then um, also risks involved uh, many of the pictures that you are showing are from really nice weather, you know, sunny and dry and so on. Uh, I'm sure there are uh, exercises with low ropes with the snow or, I don't know, uh, over the water, so there is water beneath or something. Is it unnecessary risk involved there or is it... Is is it uh, does it add to learning? Uh, is it worth risking uh, making the slow ropes in a bit more difficult conditions? That's my first question. Mm -hmm. When it comes to a bit of modifying the conditions and and adding a more risk, and second added to it is that usually, as you say, it's a group work, and we yeah. know all that we work with not that homogeneous groups. Uh, people are of different experience and they have different limits. 
what's what's your ways to actually balance it and to be able to answer different individual needs uh, while the group is really diverse and people are really having different need and different uh, um, level of uh, involvement yeah okay so let's look at the first one uh, so the first one was about adding these extra um, extra elements of risk um the way i look at things for me it's very simple if i if i don't think that i can handle it i would not propose it to others so very for me it's this is this is a key element it's really it's really important so um somehow it also goes along with this optimal arousal i i would see myself also in terms of uh, the optimal arousal theory to what extent am i also there uh, is, is it over because if it's too much it, it's also not good if it's too little it's also not good but yeah i i would say i would say this for example you gave this uh, you gave this um uh, pretty good image of working and doing something in the snow um it could be. Uh, if I would feel comfortable with it, I would probably do it. It depends what we are talking about. But we need to keep in mind what, what are those weather conditions actually uh, doing? So they are increasing uh, the risk, the risk of injury, what kind of injury, uh, and how can we work with them? Are there maybe some activities that are already designed and tested and they, they've been used already on, on, uh, on, in certain conditions? For example, I would... Uh, I would probably never do a, um, a low rope course uh, during a, a rainy a rainy day. This is something that we've always avoided because because it it's it's really dangerous from many perspectives. For me personally, I think it touches on first of all, of course, there's the safety and the physical safety of people. Then obviously there is the element of the materials that we're using and to what extent. These materials are safe to be used in those conditions. That's one. And second, to what extent those materials are safe to be used afterwards if you use them in those conditions as well. Yeah. That's because what I was thinking about. That uh, basically my first precaution would be, okay, uh, risk and injury. But second one is it really destroys the ropes. So yeah. if we want to, uh, the ropes to be long lasting, uh, we don't use them in uh, wet uh, conditions. Yeah. Yeah, okay, sometimes that might be the case that the ropes get wet uh, due to, uh, I don't know, the mo morning uh, morning water <laughs> on the plants, but I would personally avoid it. And also the risks. I, I mean, I think the weather risks could be could be used in different activities, uh, not in low rope courses. At least, yeah. to my opinion, I would rather go on a hike in the rain <laughs> and uh, see that element of the weather explored there but not on low roof sorry for jumping in i just see that we are quite a private party <laughs> so i decided to jump in <laughs> no worries no worries I, as we see we, we sort of go in the same in the same line of thought um, and then, then I think the example you gave with uh, with doing something with ropes over the water, I think this is this is a very classic. It's one of the first things I did back in, I think in two thousand four. I, I was in a training where we had this, and the distance between the trees was I think probably twenty meters, uh, so it was very very long, and it, it, you know the, the line would go so low that you almost touch the water while being on it. Uh, and having to hang on to the other one and this is an example actually you remember a little bit the timeline so already i think if i'm not wrong in the 80s they were doing this uh, uh and they were bringing kids from school actually from formal setting they were doing this in nature uh and and the incentive was that it was not actually a, a lake or a water because that would be okay you know you get out you are dry but it would be a a, a marshland so you drop in there and your shoes will stay there and so on. So you won't be able to. So that that's that adds a little bit to this spiciness, to this risk thingy, uh, you know, that that can change. So that that is something, yes, as, a, as that as an environment can. So you can play from that perspective. Yes. Weather wise, I, I would be I would be cautious, as I said. Um, and then somehow. There, it, there is a connection between your two questions because the second question is how do you uh, let me rephrase it huh? so if if i can so how do you cater for people that have let's say uh, uh, different uh, points of, uh, of arousal right 
How do you work with that diversity in, in your group? And I have to say that it, it's true that this is something that is, is quite a dilemma. It's quite difficult to work with. Uh, one of the things that I've done uh, recently was to, to actually use the first days of the training because usually um, an outdoor training using adventure um, uh, programming would be uh, four, five, six days, depending on the setting. So I would use the first days to already spot the people that are, for example, usually, again, from my practice, the ones that are more uh, prone to doing crazy things, like they want to do, they want to push their boundaries. And a lot of people will talk about this in their expectations in the very first day. They say, I'm here to push my boundaries. Uh, then the thing is that I need to understand what those boundaries are. So having a chats, having chats with people to understand a bit why they are there and what they're looking for, uh, observing them uh, on different elements, uh, small exercises, maybe on the ground first. Um, very often there is a correlation. I, I wouldn't be able to uh, scientifically prove it, obviously, but there is a correlation also between the physical stamina and, you know, and, and how much you are into physical training and so on, and certain type of exercises uh, that you do, including some of the elements actually uh, on, on the low ropes. It doesn't mean that those that are not trained physically, they cannot do it. No, on the contrary, everyone does it. I mean, there are very few people that didn't go on these. But those that are more into athletics, they would have the tendency to jump around like little uh, little goats, you know, uh, who are usually very used to altitudes and, and high inclinations and, and so on. So they would be, you know, for them, it would be a walk in the park. But having those discussions would give me this picture. And then when the activity comes... I come back to what I was saying, uh, you know, earlier, how do you work with this? You increase the number of choices, you propose uh, more stimulants, et cetera, et cetera. So you try to work with this. Um, and already one of the examples is indeed this blindfold walk. There, there were participants who were, you know, jumping on it and so on. And then I say, okay, uh, would you like to take it to the next level? Yes. Okay. Would you like to do it blindfold? And then there's like a bulb moment. It's like, oh, I never thought about that. So they also get to experience that. But this being said, it doesn't mean we always get to satisfy everyone. And I'll come back also to this point because this is an important one that I want to look in the critical uh, questions as well. We can't always cater for everyone. We need to also be aware of that and sort of live with it as well uh, from that perspective. Make sense? Okay, now let's look at some of the critical uh, questions. And here I just want to pinpoint that obviously there are many, 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 and I could have brought many, but for me, I, I just chose a couple of that that came uh, to my mind. Uh, one of the first one is is impact, the impact of what we do in adventure education, you know, and, and here the question is uh, of the, manage, uh, the, the measurement. Uh, is it my role as a practitioner to look into that? Is it my role to uh, maybe prep somehow people to, think about how do they want to use what they what they learn in the future and maybe uh, do I have a role to play in that because be, be, besides doing that usually this the outcomes are out of my hands it's 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 also somehow linked to, to this fact that there, there is um, there are uh, non-formal education principles and one of them says that the ownership of learning is with participants of course that as a trainer, you play a role in it, but I can't control what happens afterwards. So for me, still, this is something to keep in mind, uh, this idea of, um, of, of the impact. And then you have this dimension of the purpose of adventure education and challenge courses uh, and, and coming to the impact. And there are some of the elements I, I already mentioned uh, earlier relating to problem solving, related to trust and so on, and, and how that comes as an impact on the long term, because for me, when I say impact, I'm really thinking at how is this particular practice useful for my participants on the long term? How are they going to uh, make the best out of whatever they learn now, but uh, on a longer term? And last but not least, it's also this shift that we need to look to look at making from unrealistic objectives to more realistic objectives. Um, here, I have... What I have in mind is 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 is, is debatable, huh? but um, we tend, uh, for some reason, uh, at least in the way we work with outdoor, we we tend to bring the outdoor in order to serve a certain objective, a certain purpose. I'll give you an example, right? Uh, you say that when you work with outdoor and adventure education, you develop certain competencies in communication, in leadership, and so on. 
And these kind of competencies, they are also relevant, for example, in, in the field of entrepreneurship, okay? And then you use outdoor education to actually work on entrepreneurship. So you add another level uh, of complexity to, to the whole thing. Uh, and, and sometimes, sometimes the objectives that we are looking at may be um, suffering from that. So what I'm saying is that, yeah, it would be interesting to see also the possibility of doing outdoor um, and leaving outdoor within the sphere of what is uh, usually uh, classically meant uh, to be done with it. So and, and looking at how that can have also uh, an impact then, then on long term, because otherwise mixing things, um, I, I, I don't know. I, I, as I said, I don't have data to prove this, but these are some of the, the, the insights that I have and some of the concerns that, that are raised in me as a, as a practitioner. Then one important element I want to look at is the transfer of, of learning, actually. And again, it is somehow connected to, to impact, but this is more about how some of the skills you get, you actually practice them afterwards. Uh, and of course, that as a practitioner, we do create this setting where we review and we reflect uh, together and we see what are, uh, you know, what are the learning that are distilled from, from uh, the entire experience. Uh, and, and this is the moment where, where I question and, and I put this question, of the, how do we go beyond awareness? Uh, and what is the role of, of, of us as practitioners? What can we do here? Um, I remember coming across this article from Larry Prochaska uh, about the levels of learning. Um, he was looking, he was basically teaching communication in a formal setting. And he noticed that uh, the students were getting pretty good. Uh, they were able to react uh, very well to, to the skills that, and to work with the skills that he was, uh, he was teaching them. Ended up having a test. And uh, in the test, there were some real, uh, real case examples that he was giving, and participants were able to apply, at least theoretically, very well uh, these um, what they have learned, the skills to th that those particular cases, and really elaborate and so on. And to his disappointment, the next day he realized that well, people are actually they don't really they once they are out of the classroom, they don't really apply what they learn. Um, so he was looking into what are, you know, why, what is happening? So what he was looking in, into was this idea of how do we internalize learning? How do we actually incorporate it in our daily practices? And what is my role as a professional uh, in, in doing so? And he, he basically identifies several layers from uh, levels of learning, from memorizing uh, and so on, all the way to internalizing uh, the learning. And he was questioning about, uh, you know, what his role was. And interestingly enough, he was referring to, to another educator uh, who actually uh, was thinking along the lines uh, that students don't learn from him what he is actually teaching them, but who he actually is. So he thought that focusing also on who he is and how he is behaving as an educator meaning also being an example, so a role model uh, in a way for the students could be one of the ways to actually invite people uh, more into, uh, uh, into this process of finally internalizing the learning that is happening in, in a setting, rather than uh, just expecting them to get the knowledge, whatever he or she was, was sharing. So some of the thoughts on, on, on how can I also play a role as a practitioner in, a, in the adventure uh, setting in order to make sure that people, uh, you know, whatever they learn, they actually are using it on a daily basis. And it doesn't just end up being a, a nice, uh, to say, postcard, you know, that they can put on uh, on their fridge with a magnet and, and remember that one day they were there and, and that's it. Um, then there is this element that I also mentioned a bit earlier, which is about the quality and the contemporary trends, like what is happening in the society in in, in general. Now, the first thing that comes to my mind is this idea of the democratization of the outdoor. Uh, until late 1800s, um, people were not really using the outdoor for leisure. Uh, the outdoor was more for the arts or for the literature. It was a, a space uh, about which things were written uh, and, uh, and uh, through which uh, pictures were created, paintings and so on and so forth, photos, etc. 
but it was not really something that was open to everyone. And, and democratization of the outdoor also meant that uh, things, uh, pe- things were open. The nature was basically all of a sudden opening also to the working classes. I still remember again from, from my master's degree, um, uh, this very simple story um, uh, of the train lines, wh- which for me was, was outstanding. Um, my university is based in Ambleside in, in the Lake District. Uh, however, the train tracks, they stop in Windermere. Um, and f- from what I understood, what happened was that uh, people in Ambleside were asked at the time whether, you know, the train is coming and so on. And they refused to have the train coming all the way there because the train would bring all the working classes actually to nature to enjoy the lakes and so on and so forth. And since this was a richer area, they were not necessarily interested of mingling with, with, the, with the commoners, basically. So it's interesting to see how that also plays a role. Now, I'm saying this because obviously in the, in the framework of outdoor and adventure education is also the case. This has become democratized. You can now, anytime you want, go, uh, you know, go to a, an adventure park and you're going to be high up in the trees or on the low robes because some of them also have the low robe courses, right? And, and you can just have it. Uh, you can just enjoy it. Um, and this is where this part comes of, uh, you know, we are ending up consuming actually uh, something that has an educational role. Remember the four uses, right? Recreational or entertainment uh, or leisure, and then educational, developmental and theoretical. So um, there is that dimension that, that we people might come in our uh, activities and have this mindset of using it as a recreational, a leisure time. You know, it's a training on outdoor. We're going to have fun. We're going to be in nature. So our we also play a role as, as practitioners and, uh, and uh, educators in that. And the contemporary means of uh, communication doesn't help much with all the social media and the influencers and these super photos on Instagram and so on. They also portray a certain image of what the outdoor and, and uh, adventure is. Um, so obviously, as I said, this does have, we want it or not, some kind of spillover effect also in outdoor environments and in outdoor uh, education. So yeah, how do we position ourselves in this equation? Do we have also a role to play in raising awareness about this? And, and also um, somehow, uh, uh, I, I would say advising people uh, to, to, to look at nature, not just uh, as a backdrop, you know, a place where you just go and be, but a place where you can be with it actually you spend time with it quality time with it um and then i think this is the last one uh, last but not least the safety and security and i le- left it at the end obviously because it it, it is something that I also want to stress that is it is important to look at uh, uh you know the safety and security frameworks that are there uh, uh so as the, as a critical question are we aware of all these elements uh, uh are we trained for first aid do we have the competencies in case something happens uh, we have to be aware that we cannot be uh, spectators when something like this happens. we have a full responsibility uh, 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 of this and we have a role to play there and same for emergency procedures we are there to uh, to support our group uh, and and to be there when when it's uh, when it's needed um and, and again, uh, it's, it's for me, this is an extremely, extremely uh, interesting tool to use uh, because it brings out, brings out a lot, a lot of, of learning. Uh, I already mentioned some of them. Uh, I think that the, the, probably the biggest wow uh, that, that, uh, that we got was, was in terms of uh, participants at the end realizing uh, that within a couple of hours they were able to set up by themselves. So again, this dimension of ownership that you manage to give uh, through this particular uh, practical approach that I share with you is extremely important because they realize that, wow, in one or two hours, we set it up ourselves. And we fun, we enjoy, we learn so much. Uh, it's, it's amazing that we can do that actually uh, and, and that it's possible. Of course, with the support of the team, but they could do it. Uh, and and have uh, so much so much to 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 gain from it. Uh, that that was it from my side uh, in terms of talking about uh, low ropes and and how they do have this adventurous dimension. Add this divent- uh, dimension um, that you just let me know if you have any more questions now at the end.
Not from my side. Thanks a lot. What? Was very inspiring. I don't know, Viera, you have some question? Yeah, for me, yeah, I'm just <laughs> not talking <laughs> at one side and on the other side. Uh, also uh, feeling inspired because I think uh, generally uh, the, um, and this idea with low rope course uh, and the practice of actual park uh, as a big teamwork activity i think is a really cool one and one of the things i think more of a reflection when um, i was listening to you bogdi because for me it's low ropes are always exciting but on the other hand there is always this um challenge for a practitioner and for an educator in technical skills uh, because that is something which is, uh, in the end, it is really important. So for me, for example, I don't uh, feel uh, comfortable enough doing it on my own. I would rather have someone who has either low rope course certification or certified training next to me so that I feel safe. So, and it comes a bit again to the ethical question of using it because on the other hand, we want to promote it. Yeah, and it's a very powerful outdoor tool, but on the other hand, it really requires a certain skill set in order to implement. Yeah. Yeah, I agree with you. I agree with you. And and again, as as I said, for me, this was um, this was a, a a big question as well, uh, because I I am not certified. I'm using it because I I've been part of uh, quite a lot of trainings, and I I've been trained with the outdoor bound, but it, there is no specific certification on this. So the technical skills that I have, they are from practice, but they're not certified. Uh, and and you, as you've seen as well, we also adapted um, to the to 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 the reality of of different materials. So um, uh, sometimes we are using sometimes we are using uh, slack lines uh, quite often actually uh, for various reasons. We also have sections that are on the rope, but we and recently, for example, we've we've uh, we've been uh, experiencing uh, using the using uh, um, cables, like metal cables, actually. So I, I, I fabricated metal cables and I tested them uh, several times to make sure that, that they are okay. And, and then, uh, then I started using this as well. Um, so, so it's also, for me, it's a work in progress, but <laughs> I agree with you, a certification would actually make a difference. And I started looking into it. Uh, it, it looks it seems to be quite complicated, actually, at least for me personally, uh, uh, and probably uh, um, uh, I could be contradicted with it. But for me, it seems to be a little bit uh, complex uh, getting it also because of the fact that the offer is not so uh, not so rich uh, on, on, on the market, let's say. Mm -hmm. um, and, and because of the locations that I it, it's very inconvenient for me to travel 1000 2000 kilometers to 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 go and, and, and get this certification because and you have to be on the in a, anyway, it's a lot of details that are involved. And also, once you are certified, then there, there are also things to keep in mind. It, it's not just, uh, you know, there. So it, it's quite complex. I look, I started looking into it. Maybe I misunderstood it. So I, I have to, that's my next, uh, also my next personal goal is to, to contact, um, contact some of the members of this European uh, network and then see uh, F, uh, what, what is possible, understand maybe better the procedures because I would like to uh, one day get certified. I think it is useful uh, to have it. Uh, as I said, the, all those standard operating procedures and all the safety elements, uh, it's nice to have them from practice, but I think uh, having them in, in, a, in a framework of uh, certification, it, it, it's much more beneficial. It's similar to what I was, we were discussing earlier with, with Tomek about uh, uh, about being a practitioner and and you know uh, using theory but not necessarily considering extremely uh, relevant or important or not maybe not putting uh, enough important accent on it um, and and my master degree opened my my eyes to to these uh, things and and I understand how um, things are more predictable and and, and there's a higher chance uh, you know of of delivering really good quality. Uh, when you have that that uh, that background as well, yeah.